Chapter 10. Jaharis and Alasan. Their Triumphs and Tragedies. The accomplishments of King Jacaris I Targaryen are almost too many to enumerate. Chief amongst them, in the view of most students of history, are the long periods of peace and prosperity that marked his time upon the Iron Throne. It cannot be said Jaharis avoided conflict entirely, for that would be beyond the power of any earthly king, but such wars as he fought were short, victorious, and contested largely at sea or on distant soil. It is a poor king who wages battle against his own lords and leaves his own kingdom burned, bloody, and strewn with corpses, Septon Barth would write. His grace was a wiser man than that. Archmaesters can and do quibble about the numbers, but most agree that the population of Westeros north of Dornay doubled during the conciliator's reign, whilst the population of King's Landing increased fourfold. Lannisport, Gulltown, Duskendale, and White Harbor grew as well, though not to the same extent. With fewer men marching off to war, more remained to work the land. Grain prices fell steadily throughout his reign, as more acres came under the plow. Fish became notably cheaper, even for common men, as the fishing villages along the coasts grew more prosperous and more boats put to sea. New orchards were planted everywhere from the reach to the neck. Lamb and mutton became more plentiful and wool finer as shepherds increased the size of their flocks. Trade increased tenfold, despite the vicissitudes of wind, weather, and wars and the disruptions they caused from time to time. The crafts flourished as well. Farriers and blacksmiths, stonemasons, carpenters, millers, tanners, weavers, felters, dyers, brewers, vintners, goldsmiths and silversmiths, bakers, butchers, and cheesemakers all enjoyed a prosperity hitherto unknown west of the narrow sea. There were, to be sure, good years and bad years, but it was rightly said that under Jaharis and his queen the good years were twice as good as the bad years were bad. Storms there were, and ill winds, and bitter winters, but when men look back today upon the conciliator's reign it is easy to mistake it for one long green and gentle summer. Little of this would have been apparent to Jaharis himself as the bells of King's Landing rang to usher in the 55th year since Aegon's conquest. The wounds left by the cruel year that had gone before, the year of the stranger, were as yet too raw. Dot and King, Queen, and Council alike feared what might lie ahead, with the Princess Arya and Balerion still vanished from human ken, and Queen Reyna gone in search of them. Having taken leave of her brother's court, Reyna Targaryen flew to Alltown first, in the hopes that her wayward daughter might have sought out her twin sister. Lord Donal and the High Septon each received her courteously, but neither had any help to offer. The Queen was able to visit for a time with her daughter Rayella so like and yet so unlike her twin, and it can be hoped that she found some balm for her pain there. When Reyna expressed regret that she had not been a better mother, the novice Rayella embraced her and said, I have had the best mother any child could wish for, the mother above, and you are to thank for her. Departing Aldtown, Dreamfire took the queen northward, first to Highgarden, then to Craighall and Castley Rock, whose lords had welcomed her in days gone by. Nowhere had a dragon been seen, save for her own, not even a whisper of Princess Arya had been heard. Thence Reyna returned to Fair Isle, to face Lord Franklin Farman once again. The years had not made his lordship any fonder of the queen, nor any wiser in how he chose to speak to her. I had hoped my lady sister might come home to do her duty once she fled. From you, Lord Franklin said, but we have had no word of her, nor of your daughter. I cannot claim to know the princess, but I would say she is well rid of you, as was Fair Isle. If she turns up here we shall see her off, just as we did her mother. You do not know Arya, that much is true, her grace responded. If she does indeed find her way to these shores, my lord, you may find she is not as forbearing as her mother. Oh, and I wish you luck if you should try to, see off the black dread. Valerian quite enjoyed your brother, by now he may desire another course. After Fair Isle, history loses track of Reyna Targaryen. She would not return to King's Landing or Dragonstone for the rest of the year, nor present herself at the seat of any lord in the Seven Kingdoms. We have fragmentary reports of Dreamfire being seen as far north as the Barrowlands and the banks of the Fever River, and as far south as the Red Mountains of Dornay and the canyons of the Torrentine. Shunning castles and cities, Reyna and her dragon were glimpsed flying over the fingers and the mountains of the moon, the misty green forests of Cape Wrath, the Shield Islands, and the Arbor. Dot but nowhere did she seek out human company. Instead she sought the wild, lonely places, windswept moors and grassy plains and dismal swamps, cliffs and crags and mountain glens. 
Was she still hunting for some sign of her daughter, or was it simply solitude she desired? We shall never know. Her long absence from King's Landing was for the good, however, for the king and his council were growing ever more vexed with her. The accounts of Reina's confrontation with Lord Farman on Fair Isle had appalled the king and his lords alike. Is she mad, to speak so to a lord in his own hall? Lord Smallwood said. Had it been me, I would have had her tongue out. To which the king replied, I hope you would not truly be so foolish, my lord. Whatever else she may be, Reina remains the blood of the dragon, and my sister, whom I love. His grace did not take issue with Lord Smallwood's point, it should be noted, only with his words, Septon Barth said it best. The power of the Targaryens derives from their dragons, those fearsome beasts who once laid waste to Harrenhal and destroyed two kings upon the field of fire. King Jaehaerys knows this, just as his grandsire Aegon did, the power is always there, and with it the threat. His grace also grasps a truth that Queen Reyna does not, however, the threat is most effective when left and spoken. The lords of the realm are proud men all, and little is gained by shaming them. A wise king will always let them keep their dignity. Show them a dragon, aye. They will remember. Speak openly of burning down their halls, boast of how you fed their own kin to your dragons, and you will only inflame them and set their hearts against you. Queen Alisan prayed daily for her niece Arya and blamed herself for the child's flight. But she blamed her sister more. Jaehaerys, who had taken little note of Arya even during the years she had been his heir, chided himself now for that neglect, but it was Balerion who most concerned him, for well he understood the dangers of a beast so powerful in the hands of an angry thirteen-year-old girl. Neither Reyna Targaryen's fruitless wanderings nor the storm of ravens Grand Maester Benefer sent forth had turned up any word of the princess or the dragon, beyond the usual lies, mistakes, and delusions. As the days went by and the moon turned and turned again, the king began to fear that his niece was dead. Valerian is a willful beast, and not one to be trifled with, he told the council. To leap upon his back, never having flown before, and take him up. Dot not to fly about the castle, no, but out across the water, like as not he threw. Her off, poor girl, and she lies now at the bottom of the narrow sea. Septon Barth did not concur. Dragons were not vagabond by nature, he pointed out. More off than not, they find a sheltered spot, a cave or ruined castle or mountaintop, and nest there, going forth to hunt and thence returning. Once free of his rider, Valerian would surely have returned to his lair. It was his own surmise that, given the lack of any sightings of Valerian in Westeros, Princess Arya had likely flown him east across the narrow sea, to the vast fields of Essos. The queen concurred. If the girl were dead, I would know it. She is still alive. I feel it. All the agents and informers that Regodraz had engaged to hunt down Alyssa Farman and the stolen dragon eggs were now given a new mission, to find Princess Arya and Valerian. Reports soon began to come in from all up and down the narrow sea. Most proved useless, as with the dragon eggs, rumors, lies, and false sightings, concocted for the sake of a reward. Some were third or fourth hand, others with such paucity of detail that they amounted to little more than, I may have seen a dragon. Or something big, with wings. The most intriguing report came from the hills of Andalos north of Pentos, where shepherds spoke in fearful tones of a monster on the prowl, devouring entire flocks and leaving only bloody bones behind. Nor were the shepherds themselves spared should they chance to stumble on this beast, for this creature's appetite was by no means limited to mutton. Those who actually encountered the monster did not live to describe him, however, Dot and none of the stories mentioned fire, which Jaehaerys took to mean that Valerian could not be to blame. Nonetheless, to be certain, he sent a dozen men across the narrow sea to Pentos to try to hunt down this beast, led by Sir Willem the Wasp of his Kingsguard. Across that selfsame narrow sea, unbeknownst to King's Landing, the shipwrights of Bravos had completed work on the Carrick Sun Chaser, the dream Alyssa Farman had purchased with her stolen dragon's eggs. Unlike the galleys that slid forth daily from the arsenal of Bravos, she was not oared, this was a vessel meant for deep waters, not bays and covers and inland shallows. Foremasted, she carried as much sail as the swan ships of the Summer Isles, but with a broader beam and deeper hull that would allow her to store sufficient provisions for longer voyages. When one Bravo Sea asked her if she meant to sail to Yi-T, Lady Alyssa laughed and said, I may, dot but not by the route you think. The night before she was to set sail, she was summoned to the Sealord's Palace, where the Sealord served her herring, beer, and caution. 
Go with care, my lady, he told her, but go. Men are hunting you, all up and down the narrow sea. Questions are being asked, rewards are being offered. I would not care for you to be found in Bravos. We came here to be free of old Valyria, and your Targaryens are Valyrian to the bone. Sail far. Sail fast. As the lady now known as Alice Westhill took leave of the Titan of Bravos, life in King's Landing continued as before. Unable to locate his lost niece, Jaehaerys Targaryen proceeded as he always would in times of trouble, and gave himself over to his labors. In the quiet of the Red Keep's library, the king began work on what was to be one of the most significant of his achievements. With the able assistance of Septon Barth, Grand Maester Benefer, Lord Alban Massey, and Queen Alisanne of Forsum his grace dubbed, my even smaller council, Jaehaerys set out to codify, organize, and reform all the kingdom's laws. The Westeros that Aegon the Conqueror had found had consisted of seven kingdoms in truth and not just name, each with its own laws, customs, and traditions. Even within those kingdoms, there had been considerable variance from place to place. As Lord Massey would write, before there were seven kingdoms, there were eight. Before that nine, then ten or twelve or thirty, and back and back. We speak of the hundred kingdoms of the heroes, when there were actually ninety-seven at one time, one hundred thirty-two at another, and so on, the number forever changing as wars were lost and one and sons followed fathers. Oft as not, the laws changed as well. This king was stern, this king was merciful, this one looked to the seven-pointed star for guidance, this one held to the ancient laws of the first men, this one ruled by whim, t'other went one way when sober and another when drunk. After thousands of years, the result was such a mass of contradictory precedents that every lord possessed to the power of pit and gallows, and some who were not felt free to rule however he might wish on any case that came before his seat. Confusion and disorder were offensive to Jaehaerys Targaryen, and with the help of his, smaller council, he set out to, clean the stables. These seven kingdoms have one single king. It is time they had a single law as well. A task so monumental would not be one year's work, or tens, simply gathering, organizing, and studying the existing laws would require two years, and the reforms that followed would continue for decades. Yet here is where the great code of Septon Barth, who in the end would contribute thrice as much as any other man to the books of law that resulted began, in that autumn year of 55 AC, the king's labors would continue for many years to come, the queen's for nine turns of the moon. Early that same year, King Jaehaerys and the people of Westeros were thrilled to learn that Queen Alisanne was once again with child. Princess Daenerys shared their delight, though she told her mother in firm terms that she wanted a little sister. You sound a queen already, laying down the law, her mother told her, laughing. Marriages had long been the means by which the great houses of Westeros bound themselves together, a reliable method of forging alliances and ending disputes. Just as the conqueror's wives had before her, Alisand Targaryen delighted in making such matches. In 55 AC she took particular pride in betrothals she arranged for two of the wise women who had served in her household since Dragonstone. Lady Jenis Templeton would wed Lord Mulendor of Uplands, whilst Lady Prunella Celtigar was joined in marriage to Uther Peake, Lord of Starpike, Lord of Dunstanbury, and Lord of Whitegrove. Both were considered exceptional matches for the ladies in question, and a triumph for the Queen.